right, so um, really happy to have our speakers today and um, and to be hosting, uh, co-hosting with Pierre uh, Scarufi this laser. I'm Tammy Spector. I'm a professor at the University of San Francisco and teach organic chemistry, among other things. And um, for many years, I served on the um, board of Leonardo, um, and I'm also on the editorial editorial board of Leonardo. So, our first speaker will be uh, Margaret Geller. She's a senior scientist at the Center for Astrophysics of Smithsonian Astro of the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. She studies large scale spatial distribution of galaxies and its origin and is best known for maps of the nearby universe for studies of structure and evolution of systems of the galaxies and for combining redshift surveys with weak lensing maps to measure the mass distribution in the universe. And she's won uh, numerous awards and accommodations and honors. So I'll let her go from there and put up her slides. Welcome, Margaret. Look thank you very to your much. Talk. Yeah, thank you very much. Let's see. So this afternoon, I'd like to take you on the biggest journey human beings can go on. And that's a journey across the 14 billion uh, year history of our universe. We live in the first age when we can actually map the entire visible universe. And this is the story I'd like to tell you, and I'll tell you a little bit about the role I've played in it and about how things have changed so remarkably over my career. Um, I just wanna say one more thing. Sorry, I forgot to say, I, I apologize. Um, if you have questions in the audience, feel free to put it into the, into the um, chat, into the Q&A. And then when she's done speaking, then she can answer your questions, okay? Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so an image, a glorious image that's a hallmark of our time. Oops, there's a problem, I, even though when we started. Okay, a glorious image that's a hallmark of our time is this image from the James Webb Space Telescope. So what you're seeing here is a cluster of galaxies, the white fuzzy objects are galaxies that are of order six or seven billion light years away. Another way of saying that the light took six or seven billion years to get to us and it lands in this telescope that orbits the sun and we read these signals to discover what the universe is like. The red streaks are much more distant galaxies, more than twice as distant and even more. And you can see them because this cluster acts like a lens that magnifies and distorts the distant galaxies. This is a prediction of Einstein's theory of relativity, and we see it again and again realized in the universe. The amazing thing about these image, Im images is these tiny red dots here are galaxies that we see when the universe was only 250 million years old. So JWST shows us almost the entire history of galaxies like our own. And this is an amazing image. And when you think that people only realized galaxies were external to ours 100 years ago, it's amazing that today we can see them being born. So now let me take you on the journey, starting from our own galaxy, the Milky Way, and stepping out into the universe and show you how we map the way galaxies like our own Milky Way are distributed on enormous scales in the universe. From the Northern hemisphere of the earth, you can see the plane of our own galaxy, the Milky Way in the fall sky. From the Southern hemisphere, you see a much more spectacular view. This is our Milky Way galaxy as seen from Las Campanas Observatories in Chile. I often like to say that if astronomy had been born in the Southern Hemisphere rather than the North, people would have had no doubt 
where the center of our galaxy is. It's here. The dark stuff you see is dust that obscures the light from stars in the plane of our galaxy. This image also shows you an interesting thing about the range of the sizes of galaxies in the universe. These two fuzzy objects are the large and small Magellanic clouds. These three objects, the Milky Way, the, 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 the small and large Magellanic Cloud and our nearest neighbor Andromeda, which I'll show you in the next slide, are the only three galaxies visible with the naked eye from the surface of the Earth. And the reason is that their brightness is very low compared to the night sky and our eyes don't integrate long enough, or in other words, we can't open the shutter for long enough to see these objects. So we live far from the center of the Milky Way, almost 20,000 light years from it. So the light that comes from the center of the galaxy takes 20,000 years to reach us. Our nearest neighbor, Andromeda, which you can see with your naked eye again in the fall sky, uh, is about two and a half million light years from us. It's a spiral galaxy similar to the Milky Way. Galaxies like uh, this have old stars in their core and a disk where they're forming young stars. That's why it's blue. And the sun would live somewhere out here in the boonies. An object like Andromeda is a few hundred thousand light years across. And the galaxy has a mass of a trillion solar masses similar to the mass of Milky Way. Like the Milky Way, Andromeda has small companions, which are a small fraction of its mass. Uh, less than a hundredth of its mass. These galaxies are in our own local group. And in fact, Andromeda is bound by gravity to our galaxy and is coming toward us at 200 kilometers per second. You don't really have to worry about its arrival because it won't arrive here for four and a half billion years. But when it does arrive, it will merge with the Milky Way and make a mess. As we step out into the universe, we can see much larger systems of galaxies. This is a cluster of galaxies called the Coma Cluster, and it's 300 million light years away from us. It's, the, it's a very massive system, and massive systems like this, you can see the galaxies look different. So this is a massive system similar to the one in the JWST image, but closer to us. These galaxies, we call them red and dead, they're no longer forming stars, but both the most massive and least massive galaxies in the universe are like these. They cluster together in these enormous concentrations of material. These things are 10 to the 15 solar masses or a thousand trillion solar masses, and they extend for something like a million uh, like several million, the, the cluster, the core of the cluster is several million light years across. This cluster is where the mysterious dark matter in the universe was first discovered in 1933. So a man named Fritz Zwicky measured a few velocities of these galaxies relative to one another, and it was very, very difficult in those days because uh, people had to do it with photographic plates. Today, you could measure the velocity of one of these in a few minutes. Uh, so he measured a few of these, and then he applied Newton's laws to figure out how much mass there was in this cluster. And what he found is that there was much more mass than he could account for from the light made by the stars, in the, but were the stars that make the light in the galaxies. He called this the missing matter problem, but eventually it became known as the dark matter problem. This problem is still with us today. Today we know that most of the matter in the universe is dark. We know a lot about where it is, but we still don't know what it is. So today we know that 84% of the matter in our universe is dark. It doesn't interact with anything except that it interacts by gravity. So we can tell that it's there when we measure the masses of systems in the universe. Only 16% of the material in the universe is baryons, the stuff we're made of. So we are made of a minor constituent of the universe. To make matters even worse, 
only 30% of the energy density of the universe is matter. The rest is something else, very mysterious. 70% is dark energy, which we also don't know what it is. But we know it's there because it accelerates the expansion of the universe and we can measure that. Dark matter inhabits the halos of galaxies like the Milky Way. So as you go out to larger and larger radius in our own galaxy, it's dominated by dark matter. And that was discovered by Vera Rubin in the 1970s. And a picture of her is shown here. When I began in this field as a student and a graduate student at Princeton in 1970, remarkably little was known about how galaxies like the Milky Way were distributed in the universe. It was known that the Milky Way was the member of a local. What wasn't known is whether there were any larger structures. Many people thought that clusters like the Coma Cluster were more or less randomly distributed in the universe in a sea of other galaxies. When I came to the Center for Astrophysics as a postdoctoral fellow in 1974, the ability to map the universe was just coming of age. By, by the early 1980s, photographic plates had been replaced with digital detectors and that made it possible to map the nearby universe. Of course, the universe is big and life is short. And so the real challenge is to find a question and to find a question you can answer with the resources you have at hand. And the thing I wondered about is, are there patterns in the universe? Are there big patterns? And if so, what are they like and how big are they? So my colleagues, Valerie de Laferon, was the, who was then a student visiting from Paris, and John Hakra, who was another senior scientist, decided to map a slice of the universe. The rationale for that is, uh, is pretty uh, clear if you think about the Earth. So let's suppose you're approaching the Earth from outside and you want to know, does it have big structures? Let's say continents and oceans. What kind of sample would you take to figure that out? Well, if you take a patch on the earth, you'll fail the test miserably because mostly it'll land in the ocean and it doesn't tell you anything. But if you take a great circle around the earth in almost any direction, it will pass through continents. It is to take a strip across the sky and measure how far away the galaxies are that you see in that strip. So you find the galaxies by taking photographs. And then you have to find their distance. So the way we do, did that is to use this 60 inch telescope. And what we do is we spread the light out into its colors. And what we do is actually measure the velocity of the galaxy, which is proportional to its distance. So let me set, tell you a little bit about that. You've all seen light pass through a prism and be spread out to, into its colors. What we do in what we call a spectrograph that we use to measure these so-called redshift is to spread the light out using a grating. And here's a CD which acts like a grating. Now Hubble discovered in the early 20th century that galaxies are apparently receding from us in the nearby universe with velocities that are just proportional to their distances. This recession is a prediction of Einstein's theory of relativity. And the real reason that it's happening is that the space in the universe is dynamic. It's a very weird idea, but the space between the galaxies is stretching and with it, the wavelength of light stretches. So here's a movie that shows how the spectrum of hydrogen changes as galaxies are farther and farther away from us. The colored lines here represent lines in the spectrum of hydrogen. The red line is the so-called H alpha line, H beta line, and so on. The H alpha line, if you look at it in the laboratory, is at a wavelength of 6,563 angstroms. As it moves farther away, the lines shift by the same fractional amount. 
So here you can see what happens. The lines move to longer and longer, redder and redder, redder wavelengths. And by measuring that shift, we can measure essentially the distance to the galaxies, which is just proportional to this shift. So we did that at that time, as I said, we had the first digital detectors and we had to point the telescope at one galaxy at a time. And it took about half an hour to measure the shift of the spectral features in each galaxy. And we did this for over a thousand galaxies over a year or so. My colleague, John Hucker and I really expected, we were schooled where everybody knew the answer. So we didn't really expect to see a pattern. We were simply amazed when we plotted the data and saw the extraordinary pattern. This is a picture of a slice of the universe. Some of you may have seen that this image has been immortalized in a painting by Jasper Johns, who made a painting in 2020 called Slice, which incorporates this image. Let me tell you what it is. We sit here in the Milky Way and we look out into the universe to a distance of some 700 million light years. Each of the points here represents a galaxy more or less comparable in mass with the Milky Way. The blue ones are galaxies that are spiral galaxies and the red ones are these red and dead galaxies. The torso of the stick figure here is actually the coma cluster. And because we measure velocity and not distance, there's a distortion in the coma cluster because we see the motions that, that, uh, that Zwicky actually measured. So the cluster is elongated along the line of sight pointing toward us because galaxies move across this cluster in a time that's short compared to the age of the universe. What's amazing about this picture is of course there's an unmistakable pattern, an extraordinary pattern. And what it shows is that all the galaxies are in thin structures that surround or nearly surround regions where there aren't any galaxies at all. These vast regions are 200 million light years across an awful lot of nothing. This pattern of these thin structures surrounding large empty regions is now called the cosmic web. And this is the characteristic structure that galaxies trace in the universe. These structures are enormous. They extend for hundreds of millions or even billions of light years. And this is the largest pattern known in nature. We know something about how this pattern forms because we have observations of the very early universe. And we have that because it's carried to us by the so-called microwave background, which fills the universe. That radiation today is at a temperature of three degrees Kelvin, and it's very uniform. If the surface of the earth were as uniform as the early universe when it had an age of 400,000 years, the highest peak on earth would be the highest peak on Massachusetts, pretty in Massachusetts, pretty boring. From these observations of the microwave background, we understand what the irregularities are in the very early universe when it had an age of 400,000 years. And people can simulate the evolution of what happens to particles interacting under gravity as the universe evolves. In an expanding universe, weird things happen. Gravity makes lumps and it also makes holes. So here you can see that even at an age of 200 million years, the age probed by the James Webb Space Telescope picture I showed you initially, there's a clump of stuff. So here in this image, the particles are really the dark matter that traces the structure. As the universe ages, the pattern becomes more and more distinct. The lumps become bigger, and the holes become bigger. So now we're at a giga year, now we're at 4.7 giga years, and you see this thin filamentary structure and the big cluster similar to the coma cluster. And now you're close to the current age of the universe. This is 13.6 giga years. The best estimate of the current age is now 13.8. 
There are fancier simulations now, which trace not only the dark matter, but also the light emitting baryons that we're made of. And in fact, these sophisticated simulations produce simulated galaxies. And here you can see in yellow the way the galaxies trace the dark matter that's shown in blue. And you can see this web-like structure tracing uh, the, how the galaxies trace the web-like structure on very large scales. The amazing thing about the universe is that the history is there for us to see. As we look out in space, we look back in time. So as a simple example, when we look at the sun, we actually see it as it was eight minutes ago because it takes light eight minutes to arrive to us from the sun. In the universe, as I mentioned earlier, we detect photons that have been traveling to us for hundreds of millions or billions of years, and they show us the history of the universe. So not only can we simulate the history of the universe, we can also observe it. In the last decade, my colleagues and I have made a map of what we call the intermediate or middle-aged universe. This map is called HectoMap, and it uses two of the largest telescopes in the world. The MMT, which is located in Arizona, and we do that for measure, we use that for measuring the redshifts. It's a six and a half meter telescope. And the Subaru telescope, which is operated by the Japanese on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. It's an eight meter telescope. And currently it has mounted on it uh, the largest camera in the world. So it's a gigapixel camera. So this is used to take the images that we use to find the galaxies, and this is used to do the spectra. Things have advanced enormously, so we don't do one galaxy at a time, but 250 at a time, and we use much fancier technology, not only digital detectors, but also fiber optics, which enables us to carry the light from the images of galaxies in the focal plane to the spectrograph where the light is dispersed and we measure these redshifts. So in 1986, when we mapped our first slice, as I said, it took 25 minutes a galaxy. Now in an hour, we measure 250 objects at more than 10 times the distance. It's amazing how the technology has advanced. And of course, advances in science go hand in hand with the advances in technology and astronomy is a consumer of all of the most recent data reduction and data simulation technologies. The images, ground-based images from the Subaru telescope are spectacular, not as spectacular as JWST, but this is a cluster at a distance of some four or five billion light years. And uh, the the sort of yellowish thing is one of these red and dead galaxies and these blue streaks are gravitationally lensed distant galaxies. Here they're blue because this image is not as deep as the JWST image. So these galaxies are closer to us than the ones that are imaged in the JWST. So these galaxies are a few billion years old, not a few hundred million. So what we do is we figure out we make this 2D image into a 3D map by measuring the redshifts. And we've measured not a thousand, but a hundred thousand. So, so now what I'd like to show you is how the map accumulates as we make the observations. So when we started these observations, you can see, so our early map was about this deep, about where the hand is. And you can see these are some observations from shallower surveys. You can see the hint of the kind of structure that we observed. As I start the movie, you can see the map build up. And we're looking back to a time when the universe was something like 8 billion years. So we look back something like 6 billion uh, light years. So the most distant galaxies are 6 billion light years away. Here you can see this characteristic structure. It's very similar. You have holes, thin structures. There are dense regions that are clusters of galaxies. We use this map, among other things, to discover how the galaxies trace the dark matter. 
And we use this phenomenon that Einstein predicted of lensing. You see, you've seen the lensing by clusters and we identify the clusters and we can measure their masses. So here you can see again, the same map and the red white circles are where all the clusters are and the insets show some images of the clusters. And by comparing this with the images from the Subaru telescope, we can measure the mass of each cluster and figure out where the dark matter is and how the galaxies trace the dark matter. It turns out that things do more or less what the simulations tell us they do, that the dark, that the galaxies on large scales trace the dark matter distribution. So as I mentioned in the first part of the talk, we know a lot about where the dark matter is, but we still don't know what it is. Technology is continuing to, of course, enable more and more ambitious surveys of the universe. And now there's a survey that's going on at Kitt Peak National Observatory. So it uses the four meter telescope at Kitt Peak, which is in Arizona. And now this telescope is dedicated to a large survey of the universe. This survey will reach a depth of 11 billion light years. And they measure not 250 galaxies at a time, but 5,000. And they intend to measure something like 30 million, not 100,000. And that should be, this survey should be completed in the next few years. So the journey continues and we continue to discover more and more about the patterns in the universe and how they came to be. It's remarkable that in spite of these advances, there are still very deep unanswered questions. What is the dark matter? What is the dark energy? So there's a long way to go and there are mysteries still to be uncovered. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, you want to take the question, the Q&A first? I also have a question. Yeah, do you see that there, then, Margaret? You're able to see it? I don't see it. Okay, um, I'll just read it to you. It says, the very early bright galaxies discovered by the JWST can be explained by primordial black holes, which also are suggested by the non-stellar mass distribution from LIGO Virgo. What is your opinion on primordial black holes? How long might mainstream astrophysics takes to overcome the organizational inertia of particle dark matter if another explanation becomes empirically more likely? Well, it's hard to answer that question, but first of all, the JWST galaxies are, there is no evidence that they're around black holes, none. Um, and in fact, they're, they're not really that well understood. There are some that are massive and some that are very low mass. And some of them are forming stars like crazy. The thing, the challenge that they actually present is that if the ones that appear to be massive are as massive as they seem, that's a challenge to our theory of the way objects form in the universe because these form too rapidly. The uncertainty is that JWST doesn't measure redshifts, these spectroscopic redshifts that we measure. What they measure are what's called photometric redshifts. So they measure it from the colors of the galaxies and those can be very inaccurate. So there's a lot of, and then also um, there are a selection, what we call a selection effect that if you observe these galaxies, you'll observe the brightest ones. So although many galaxies have black holes in their core, nothing at all is known about that in these young galaxies, nothing. Thank you. I have a question. Um, a long time ago, when I was in school, they told me that the universe is uniform. Yes, it is. And, <laughs> and then clearly what you just showed me convinced me that my teacher was wrong. Well, if you take a big enough sample, than it is. You have to take samples that are larger than this pattern. So this pattern, the question is, how big is the biggest pattern? So the patterns extend for something of order a billion light years. The question is, are there any bigger patterns? So if you take patches much bigger than a billion light years across, then 
on that average over that huge scale, the universe is pretty uniform. It's the same everywhere. But these patterns, it's not the same. And we know on the scale of us, the universe is certainly not uniform. So it depends on what scale you average over. And what wasn't known when I started out is people thought that it was uniform on a much smaller scale than it is. Uh, um, then you said uh, that uh, we don't know what dark matter is, but we know where it is. Right. Is the where a clue to finding out the what? The where has turned out not to... It, it has placed some constraints on what it is, but people are trying to figure that out in the laboratory. Um, and the where it is places some constraints, but it's not enough constraints. So it's eliminated some candidates, but still we don't know what it is. So the where we discover just by its gravity and that eliminates some kinds of candidates. So the matter has to be what we call cold, meaning that it can cluster in clusters of galaxies. So we're hot, it wouldn't cluster the way it does. So that tells us something about its properties. But, and there are then, but then for these cold dark matter particles, there are lots of candidates. And among those, it's still very hard to distinguish. And there's a lot of work going on in the laboratory, but it's still an open question. And all these new tools that are coming up to see further back in the universe, are they the kind of thing we need to find out what dark matter is, or we need something different? Well, I think that probably to find out what it is, the real answer to that will probably come from laboratory physics. Um, these a lot of these maps that reach deeper into the universe may tell us more about what the dark energy is and its nature, because the dark energy leaves an imprint on the structure. Right. Hmm. 